Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. You're seeing a flesh and blood being in the middle of flames, and it's not burning. This object was something out of Star Wars of today. I just sat there and I was totally gobsmacked. And a very strange thing was about to happen to me that uh, changed my life forever. These stories are some of the strangest experiences ever described in the UK. We can't tell if they're true, but they are all recounted by ordinary people. Now, they are your witnesses. Wem in Shropshire, 1995. Horrified locals witnessed a fierce fire demolish the old town hall. The true cause of the fire remains unknown, even today. But as the smoke cleared, a far more sinister mystery rose from the ashes. Today, the restored town hall is once again a local landmark. Its restoration was a huge project for the town, and one of the first people on the scene the morning after the Great Fire was demolitions expert Roger Stokes. It was the morning after that I arrived here at the town hall uh, to look at the damage along with the, the fire officer and assess what we could do to make the building safe. Uh, so we walked up the metal fire escape which was had managed to survive. Uh, you get this sooty, oily deposit. And as we got up there and we came to walk onto the landing, I noticed a series of what appeared to be footprints uh, coming across, diagonally across the, the, the landing. Looking at them, I thought, well, these are a child's footprints. They look to be about the size that are, I don't know, 10, 12, possibly 14. And I happened to mention to the fire officer, I, I said, the kids have been up here early this morning, haven't they? Uh, and he said, well, no, there's been nobody up here at all. We've been the first, we're the first two people that have been up here. We've had fire crew on duty all night, and there have also been police officers outside, so there's no, nobody been up here at all. Roger Stokes is not naturally superstitious, and as the reconstruction of the hall was a priority, he wrote the incident off, until a few weeks later. One of the labourers, along with the site agent, saw a figure. They couldn't see the head in detail, but it looked like somebody wearing a long dress. And there was a glow around it. They obviously didn't really take too long a look at this. They saw it and hightailed it back down the, the stairs as fast as they could go. Had something sinister happened on the night of the fire? What or who was behind these unexplained sightings? When the demolition crew had moved in to clear the wreckage, one small section of the original town hall had mysteriously survived. Charred but intact, this plaque, now hanging in the new entrance, held a vital clue. It was in March 1677 that the, uh, what had become known as the Great Fire of Wem uh, broke out in a cottage at the top of Leak Lane, uh, at the, about 50 yards from what is now the modern town hall. The fire swept through the town, uh, virtually destroyed it, and at the end of it all, uh, the scapegoat, I suppose, for it was Jane Cherm, a 14-year-old uh, maid. 
uh, who was preparing a fire for uh, the, her sister coming home from work. And um, she accidentally set fire to the inside of the thatched roof of the cottage where she was living and working. The fire, over 300 years ago, started by the young Jane Churn, combined with the mysterious survival of the commemorative plaque, intensified the intrigue. But a crucial witness from the night of the fire emerged that would propel the mystery to the front pages of the world's press. Yeah, on this specific night I was dancing away, I'm about 200 miles away, and I saw a large plume of smoke in the sky, night sky. Now, I always take my cameras with me, and at this time, at this specific day, I had them with me in the car. So I jumped out, run round, and took as many pictures as possible of the fire. One was round the back on the fire escape, there's some on the, on the main roof of the building, and also round the front where I thought the front, the, the gable end was going to come down. When I was developing the negatives, I noticed there was a spot on one of the negatives that shouldn't have been there. I noticed there was a, like a small head sticking over the railings by the fire escape. So then I developed it on, on paper, and as I was swilling it, starting to develop it, this little head come through and it's like a, a body of a young girl. Looks like a girl standing behind the fire escape with the flames lapping around her. And where it come from, I don't know. The figure in the photo stands directly on the spot where Roger Stokes discovered the footprints the following morning. Could this apparition be Jane Churn? Was this the figure the construction workers saw before they fled? If it wasn't Jane Churn, who or what was it? It's very unlikely that anybody could have just wandered around in an area where firefighters would have been working for several hours unnoticed and then to have climbed to the external staircase and stood where allegedly the photograph suggests that they would have stood. It's the way I imagine Jane Churn might have looked, uh, sweet-faced, uh, Lots of curls, the sort of girl who would fill a, a maid role in a cottage or, or house, yes. If anybody had been standing there, you know, their clothes would have ignited within seconds, their, their skin would have blistered very, very quickly. No human being could have stood there for at all, let alone for any length of time. With the photograph is important visually as, as when it's important that we look for any explanation that we possibly can. So, first of all, we look for, could it possibly be a double exposure? a deliberate hoax, uh, and from our point of view, having looked at the, the negative, the original negative on uh, high power digital enhancing equipment, we couldn't see any evidence of trickery, double exposure, fraud or anything like that. We approached uh, Dr Vernon Harrison. He was uh, past president of the Royal Photographic Society and he'd been heavily involved in, uh, in Kodak for, for many years. He said he could find absolutely no evidence of double exposure, no evidence of fraud. What he did find, in his opinion, and that has to be stressed, it's only Vernon's opinion, uh, was that what Tony had caught on film, basically, quite innocently, and what is on the photograph is a large chunk of wood happened to be caught in the act of falling. So in Vernon's opinion, this was basically just bits of debris from the building. Dr Vernon Harrison stated in his letter that he thinks it's a fallen piece of wood falling from the roof. Um, I can't shout myself. I, I, to me, it looks very much like a young girl. But at the end of the day, uh, where it is, I, I don't know. But it looks like a young girl to me. I suspect it's not a piece of timber. It actually looks as if the, the apparition, whatever it might be, is, is outside of the building rather than inside the building anyway. It doesn't look like a piece of timber might look, actually. It's definitely a face. Definitely a young girl. Uh, a nice, uh, pretty young girl, yes. Footprints in the still smouldering aftermath of the Great Fire. Two construction workers fleeing an apparition. And then, 
the photograph. A burning log? A clever hoax? Or Jane Cherm, the young servant girl responsible for the devastating fire in Wem 300 years before? Nobody's trying to hoodwink anybody, as f certainly as far as I know and as I believe it. This story is true. I really don't know what it was, whether it was a piece of timber or whether it's a real apparition, but I do know what it wasn't. It certainly wasn't a human being. I don't think it's double exposure. I don't think it's falling wood. What I think the photograph possibly shows is maybe an apparition. And as far as we're concerned, the case still remains open. I don't believe in ghosts, but I know there's something on that photograph that shouldn't be there. At the end of the day, this photograph has made my life hell. And I wish that someone had said to me what is on the photograph and explain to me what it is, and I'll be quite happy then. You're seeing a flesh and blood being in the middle of flames, and it's not burning. And you have seen, or I have seen, the results of that figure being there. You don't believe what you've seen, you can't believe what you've seen, and yet you have seen what you've seen. Even as I tell the story now, the hair on the back of my neck is honestly standing up on end. These little creatures, uh, about three foot, three foot six high, with lamp-shaped heads. That's how I described it, and I was very, very frightened of it. There's a light coming from underneath. I'm getting back into the car. I'm going. This unique video footage is of Police Constable Alan Godfrey in a state of hypnotic trance. There's a light. Mm -hmm. There's a light. Doctors are attempting to recover 40 minutes from Alan's consciousness, lost on a cold night in November 1980. PC Godfrey had been out on night shift, driving out to a local estate near Todmorden to investigate a series of strange reports from concerned locals. Just as I'm about to turn up there, something caught my caught me my eye. I was kind of going to turn up and then I looked up the road and there was an object. Whatever that object was, it made me stop turning and I decided to go and investigate. I got within about 20 yards of this object and I'm telling you now, forget what you might believe or disbelieve, this object was something out of Star Wars of today. Was I scared? I suppose I was. I'm scared when I go to a domestic. I'm scared when I go to a pub to eject a drunk. You get an adrenaline rush. I just sat there and I was totally gobsmacked. It's never crossed my mind at that time, was it a spaceship? You know, that was the last thing I was thinking. I was just wondering what the hell it was, what it was doing there. And I was more concerned about somebody coming the other way and, and crashing into it. I just didn't know what to do with it. PC Godfrey tried to radio back to base on two separate radios, but was unable to get through on either. So I, I'm left here with a situation, I won't say panicking, but wondering what to do next. I had to make a decision pretty quick. What are you going to do? I remember picking my clipboard up, and I thought I'll do a sketch, a quick sketch of this. It was approximately 20 feet wide. It was about 14 feet high. It was hovering off the ground. I could see my police car, the headlights were shining right underneath it. It was diamond in shape, but the bottom half of the object seemed to be rotating anti-clockwise very slowly. But as I'm watching it, you know, we're in gobble. I realised that it was actually going that fast clockwise, it was the optical illusion of going backwards. 
and then it was just this brilliant, brilliant bright light. It was just a poof. And then I was at the other side of the object, just like that. I was another 40 yards up the road, and I'm driving the car. First reaction, looked in the mirror, nothing there. Turned the car around, went back to the scene, nothing there. What's going on, you know? I'd be hallucinated. If it was, it was very, very real. It was a very, very real hallucination. No, I, I realised what I'd seen was real and it had happened. Why would he come forward? Unless it was true, what's he got to gain? He's not doing it for financial gain. Net money's never been discussed when I'm talking to him. You know, it's just clearly bothered him. Uh, he has seen something at close proximity, within 30 metres in this case, for a duration of seven to eight minutes. You know, you can't get confused at 30 metres. And at 30 metres, you can rule out all the usual excuses of a meteor, balloon, swamp gas, aeroplanes, whatever. What other people have said over the years, you know, that I've been told it was Venus. What Venus was doing blocking the road, I don't know. I mean, lots of theories have gone round at the time. Uh, I'm telling you, that object was real. It was solid. It was a nuts and bolts crap, believe you me. Over the next few weeks, several other sightings of strange objects in the night skies came in. Five other police officers from the surrounding areas all reported that they had seen something strange that night. Alan was asked by his superiors to sign the Official Secrets Act, but the story had already hit the national press and attracted the attention of UFO investigator Harry Harris. I was then contacted by Norman Collins. He was then a detective inspector of police, head of the Manchester Fraud Squad. He invited me to come and interview Alan. Um, a crowd of us crowded into Alan's front room and Alan related his event. And then after that, he's grilled by Norman Collinson. And I mean grilled. At some stage, and I can't remember at what point, it became apparent that he'd lost time. Through exhaustive interrogation, the team discovered that roughly 40 minutes of Alan's evening remained missing. But they couldn't account for what happened. When we discovered that Alan had suffered an amnesia, a missing time, it occurred to me that hypnosis might assist in probing his missing memories. And we arranged acts of hypnosis to be carried out by uh, a consultant psychiatrist and lecturer in clinical psychiatric medicine at Manchester University and another doctor who carried out hypnosis uh, for the police. There's a light coming from underneath. I'm getting back into the car. I'm going. For the car, I'm going. It was a bit strange watching yourself asleep, for want of a better word. Um, but I was telling the incident as, a, as I remembered it in my conscious memory, you know, leaving the police station doing all what I've told you earlier on, right up to doing this sketch. I hear myself saying that I'm floating, I'm being carried or floating, it's, it's black, everything's black and uh, I tell you that uh, I'm in a room and there's some horrible things in there and I, I had to describe them. Horrible. Who's horrible? They are. Who's they? I want to talk about them. Why not? Because they're horrible. Mm. Can you briefly describe? Mm. I don't know. What does that look like? The small. Yeah. And I'm sat watching this and I'm thinking, what's this all about? And he mentioned, I mentioned, uh, these little creatures, uh, about three foot, three foot six high, uh, with lamp-shaped heads, uh, with dark eyes. That's how I described them. I was very, very frightened of them. Any objects on the bed? No. From they want to get on it. They want you to get on it. Mm. Are you getting on it? 
It, it was kind of watching yourself and, and saying, yeah, I would react like that. I would, I would do that. But I can't remember doing it. You know, this is weird, this. This isn't... This can't be right, you know. He's... I'm getting on him. You're getting on with it. Why are you getting on it now, then? I just thought about getting on it. No, no right. I describe these creatures attaching something, a bracelet or something, to my leg. And these little things came over and plugged into this. Oh, when, when I heard that, that, that did it for me. I had to do, <laughs> what do you do? do? Do you believe what you're saying? I mean, been abducted by an alien? I mean, it's not right, is it? You know, <laughs> come on, it, were right. it, were, it was bad enough having to live with the I've seen a UFO syndrome. Never mind, I've seen a UFO and been abducted. Disturbed me. So I had to come up with a solution. <laughs> I, uh, all these things are flying around in my head, and I'm thinking, there's got to be an answer. There's got to be a rash. I'm a policeman. Got to be. There's got to be a rational answer to this. Why am I saying this? What am I coming this incredible story for? Did it happen, or didn't it happen? I I believe Alan wholeheartedly. I don't believe he's capable, uh, or that for that matter, anybody is capable of duping something for so long under those conditions, i.e., three months apart quite obviously hypnotised, quite obviously deeply hypnotised, comes out with the same scenario, same answers to the same questions. No, I, I, I don't believe his life one moment. If it was the only case ever reported, and nobody else had ever said anything similar, then you might say, well, this is odd. How come it's only just happened to one West Yorkshire Bobby and not to anybody else? But there's a rash of cases, not only in this country, all over the world. Alan Godfrey's not alone. I know the incident, the encounter was real. That's no argument that I'll stand up anywhere you like and I have done for 22 years and I'm not going to change my mind now. That incident happened. It was a nuts and bolts crap and I wasn't the only person that saw it. The hypnotic regressions and the abductions, one or two things. It happened, it was real or I was reliving something that I'd read about and got it confused with my own memory. And when I've been hypnotised, I've come out with that. Nobody will ever know. Not even myself. But uh, that is the way I cling on to reality.